Hi everyone, as Professor Mormon just said, I'm a junior bioengineering major here in Miami. The Lockheed Martin Leadership Institute is an organization that is composed of engineering and computing students who desire to expand their leadership skills and better prepare for their future careers. We do this through a rigorous transformational leadership experience where the first year is professional, personal leadership, second is people leadership, and the third brings them all together with strategic leadership. Personal leadership is, much like how it sounds, all about learning and analyzing the self, how we as individuals can grow to be better leaders. People leadership is most predominantly learning about how we as leaders can inspire others within an organization toward a unified vision or goal. Lastly, strategic leadership, we can learn how to combine person and people leadership to better apply it to industry and professional settings after college. After about two years in the Institute, my cohort members and I have quickly realized that in order to thrive as a leader after college, we have to learn how to adapt to change. At the beginning of the fall semester last year, this idea became evident when Professor Mormon asked us what we wanted to base our project on. Several weeks passed and the notion of change was something all of us as a cohort could agree on, but now a more daunting challenge lay in front of us. What is change? Determining what change meant seemed to be a topic fit for philosophers or people who had spent their entire life in a library. But nevertheless, we began attacking the problem and figuring out what change means to us and how we would even go about researching such an abstract topic. Now that we were well into working on the project, we began to reflect on our own experiences to start answering the question we had set out for ourselves. The best real world examples that presented themselves to my cohort members and I were all of our experiences in internships over this most recent summer. What we drew from these experiences, as well as lessons, we were experiencing in the classroom were how important digital transformation, understanding different personalities and behaviors, a growth mindset, and leadership development planning are to the professional environment. So please join us as we delve into our project of embracing change, as we ourselves embrace change due to these new circumstances. In every aspect of our lives, we become accustomed to a certain way of doing things. How computer programs work, how to effectively communicate, the types of work we do, the types of people we work with, so on and so forth. We develop a mindset stuck in our expectations. We are fixed in place and possibly resistant to expanding. What happens when reality interferes, infiltrates this stubborn mindset we have? What happens when things change and we resist? We suffer individually and as a collective. In today's world, constancy is a rarity. Everything and everyone is changing more rapidly than ever before. In order to adapt and change in parallel, we need to learn to adapt on an individual level. This means we need to know ourselves and we need to identify what roadblocks we face. These boundaries can manifest in a variety of ways ranging from generic bias to implicit bias, from PQ to EQ, from mind bugs to mind traps. These and others will be the topics we go over today in terms of how we can approach and address these to best embrace the ever-changing world around us. Embracing change as we describe it is the personal determination to develop an open mind and body inclusiveness and inspire creativity daily. There are certain acknowledgments we have to make in order to embrace change effectively, however. To start, we must recognize that change is here and to stay and that we should be prepared to experience pushback. This discomfort and loss of control are central to what change does to us. We need to know how much change we are capable, capable of undergoing at one time, and any limitations we have can best spread out through long-term goals. Finally, we need to recognize that we need to be proactive and get ahead of the change. It is more detrimental when we react. If we get out early and accept the differences of others, rather than forcing our view, we are more likely to succeed in embracing change. So. Everything is changing. Why embrace it? Why not just stick to your guns and dig in your heels? You could argue that's what people have done in the past. They were fine, so I will be too. One thing is different today though. Technology, specifically artificial intelligence, provides us an incentive to not think this way. If a worker at Amazon, for example, gets an attitude, in comes a machine that doesn't argue, a robot. People in the past did not have that threat. To stay at the forefront, to stay relevant, we must examine ourselves and make the necessary adjustments. If we don't, 
You don't have to anymore. Instead, we'll have to find a new job. In each of the topics we discuss today, we will try and relate back to the significance and importance surrounding the idea. How can you use them? What advantage will understanding them provide? We will be considering our own minds and the barriers we have. The topic of embracing change is really an important idea to me because I experienced firsthand the necessity of change in a professional environment, namely a year-long research project at the National Laboratory in Oak Ridge, Tennessee. For background, I am from Oak Ridge, which is about 40 minutes outside of Knoxville. My high school has a unique program where we can work under a professional on a project over the course of the year and then have the opportunity to present our work for the school and in several fairs around the state. Before I had even started my senior year, I was in contact with my advisor, who told me I would be studying the gassing process produced from different amounts of a solid silicon nickel manganese cobalt ion battery pouch cell and different electrolytes at different temperatures. Big stuff, obviously. And as I'm certain you're all concluding now, I was neither equipped technically or professionally as a senior in high school to even begin performing solid work. But begin work I did. As the beginning of the year rolled around and I found myself touring the lab spaces, I would be spending the better part of eight hours every week after classes. An important distinction to make at this point in my story is that I thought myself to be much smarter, capable, and professional than I was in any sense of those words. Being a senior in high school, I was at the top of the food chain. The idea that there were other food chains and other ladders to climb outside of class was completely foreign to me. So during my initial meetings and introductions, I didn't pay attention to the nuances of the meetings and interactions of other members of the group, especially the group had with one another or what I was really doing to be completely honest. I was so blinded to my own faults by my childish ego, I didn't even know what a journey I was in for. Over the course of the first months of my work, I spent a lot of time reading, which I didn't do with any intensity because why would I? This is my senior year. What more do I have to learn? Then I was tasked with making the electrolyte and pouch cells that I would use for the rest of the year, which I did without much scrutiny, again, because I saw the task as nothing more than menial work that was in my way for the real stuff. I actually fell asleep during my first group meeting, if that gives a good enough picture of where my mind was during this process. So of course, these behaviors weren't going to last and after I started to collect data and was told, I needed to not only present what I found, but also my thoughts on why and where I got, where I wanted to go with my work. How was that gonna work out? Of course, I had been had. I not only could not voice what was happening effectively, but I had no thoughts as to why some of my pouches were gassing and others weren't. So after an extremely embarrassing week and a half, I realized I had a problem and started examining what I was doing, asking my parents how I could change certain things so I wasn't the family embarrassment. I started back at the beginning by going through the readings, trying to understand what I had missed. I then started to focus and think about what was happening around me to funnel the knowledge into my work. The icing on the cake was realizing I, in fact, knew absolutely nothing. And the people I worked with were not only smart, but masters in a field I had participated in for less than a year. After all was said and done, I saw an issue with myself that was detrimental to my standing professionally at the present moment, as well as possibly into the future. Realizing the need to change, I worked hard to do so. Because of that, I was able to present my research in Los Angeles that year for the World Fair. Now that I know about embracing change, I realize that everything we will discuss with you today, I experienced in some form. Literally, all of the mind traps that we will talk about affected me to bias as well as saboteurs. Thank you for listening.